Crossroads Church to the second installment of Q&A with Pastor Chris. Mm. My name is Pastor Chad, and we are so excited that you're watching this, and we're looking forward to answering the questions that you submitted. Now, just as a little bit of an encouragement, uh, we only received two questions this week, and we would love more. Yeah, definitely. We would love more love questions. So get on that text number. You're allowed to do it during church. I give you permission. <laughs> just not during worship, but during the sermon. It's yeah, totally absolutely. fine. absolutely. It's okay during the sermon. <laughs> So as things come up, as you're thinking, as uh, the teaching's happening, just send in questions. We'd love to interact with you in that way and answer those. The first question this week uh, says this, what are the unrepresentable parts of the church that need to be treated with modesty? Private parts? I know this is an analogy using the body, and I wouldn't have bothered to go there, but Paul did. So I went there too, so it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's coming from that passage, 1 Corinthians 12. I'll just read it in its context. So Paul says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. Um you, the question does mention the fact that obviously this is an analogy. And so sometimes we're not supposed to stretch analogies, you know, too far. Mm -hmm. um, there is a general principle with the idea of weaker parts or unpresentable parts or less valuable the way we might view parts of the body. Um, I think just physically thinking about it, um, an, a, a weaker part of the body actually would be considered your brain in that sense. So think about like your brain, but it's, it appears to be weaker because it's so small, soft, and it can be damaged and that sort of thing. But what, do, what did God do to protect our brain? He has a special place, yeah, right? A skull that protects the brain. So it actually has special honor, even though it's weaker. Um, so that's one way to think about it. Then the unpresentable parts, um, we, we know what that's talking about, the idea of modesty. Um, but he, he's talking about, he says there, but we, we um, provide special covering for them, right? So the idea is that even though we would say in a, in a modest society, um, we cover certain parts of our body up, they actually get special special treatment because they are covered up because they're so, we could say, so special, right? So so that's kind of the idea there. The, the goal is that there's no one part that's more valuable than the other part within the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And even those parts that seem like they're less important or not as um, visible, mm -hmm. the way God looks at them, he treats them with special honor. It's almost like they, in God's eyes, are elevated more because... If you think about it, you, we don't cover our faces, generally speaking, but we do cover other parts of our body. Um, our face tends to get the focus and the attention from people, but that doesn't mean the other parts of our body, uh, body aren't important. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like your face gets credit and glory, so he wants to make sure other parts of the body get elevated as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the idea there, that even the parts of our body that seem like they're weak or unimportant or you know hidden away actually get special attention and uh, are elevated in that way. And so I think it's just the idea there is he goes on just talking about we're all equal um, in the yeah. body. All the parts of the body are equal and important. And even those parts of the body that, that aren't on full display are so important that they actually have a special protection for them. And that's mm -hmm. just God's way of saying every part is really important mm -hmm. in the body of Christ. So. I liked how on Sunday you talked about your role. Yeah. And how it's it's easy to think that it's the most important. Mm -hmm. And I would say oh. that's true of a lot of leadership, you know, visibly present yep. positions in the church. But sure. coming from a leader, and I know you would feel the same way, like yeah. we can't do what we do without no. the support of the entire body and all those other things that are happening behind 100%. the scenes. 100%. Yep. That's great. Okay. Uh, second question uh, says this. I have heard some critique regarding the motive of the church as a family, citing that it's a form of spiritual abuse. Mm -hmm. I think this applies more to the little C church than the big C church mm -hmm. universal, but I'd love to hear you address this danger mm -hmm. regardless. When can it be unhealthy to see the church as a family? Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that. It's really more of a kind of a modern issue. 
um, that that concept would be, you know, th- speaking of the, the church as a family, it, just because of the kind of the culture we live in now, um, it's something that is, is addressed more, I think, not that there weren't toxic families back in the ancient world. Um, I kind of mentioned it a little bit and made a joke out of the idea of some of you, like the last thing you want to think about is another family because like the drama in your own family, mm, yeah. that's kind of part of it. So like, so there, there can absolutely be a negative aspect to this idea of family. Now where I think, but, but however, I always want to be clear just because um, maybe um, culturally or personally, there are things in the Bible that um, we might personally not um vibe with very well, or maybe we've had bad experience with family, um, or even you've been in a toxic church where a leadership culture abused the idea of family or others abused it. It doesn't mean that it's it's not a good image for us, because um, yeah. it's given to us in God's word as a way of thinking. I mean, obviously, we are called brothers and sisters in Christ. That's familial language. Um, Christ, we are co-heirs with Christ, so it's like Jesus is our big brother. Um, God is called our father. Mm-hmm. And so um, the language is there and we, we are part of Abraham's offspring, right? So we're part of this big family called the body of Christ, uh, God's people. Um, and so it's biblical language. Now, how can it be abused? It can absolutely be abused by one. I'll just start with um spiritual authority, like spiritual leaders can use it. Mm. I, I've heard pastors um, kind of use the language as they're the the kind of head of the family in the church. Mm-hmm. They're kind of the, you know, the father. And I know some Christian churches traditions use that language of leaders, but it can be it can be taken in an abusive way where I'm the father, I'm the authority, um, and kind of uh, attach people to him as a leader in a way that's not the best and can, and can be used to control them and used to like heap guilt on people too. You know, I'm the dad and you're, you're the kids and you better do what I say. That kind of language. It can also be, a, I think, abusive or, or just toxic or unhealthy when people in the congregation, let, let's say um, a particular individual or family member for whatever reason is feeling like maybe they should leave the church for whatever reason and um, the the idea of family is kind of thrown at them. Well, we're family, so you can't leave. Like, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Where there is some, there's a healthy aspect of that is the church body, the church family shouldn't be just something that you just get up and leave. And if you understand that we actually, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, that does cause you to, to go a little bit more carefully in the sense of, Okay, let me consider this. I'm not going to just pick up and go and leave, just like I can't just pick up and go and leave my my biological family. I'm always going to be a part of that family. So that's I think there's a healthy aspect to that too, but it can definitely be used in a controlling way. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you're our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're family. You can't leave. Yeah. Even if it's an unhealthy or like uh, spiritually, like in the sense of um, they're not teaching, they're not being faithful to the Bible, or there's just really unhealthy, bad stuff taking place in the church or it's a, it's a toxic leadership environment or something, people could really use that idea of family to control and keep you in a place when you really probably should go as well. So Mm -hmm. those are ways I can see it being abused, but I never, I don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater because it is biblical imagery that's given to us to help us understand the goodness of being a part of the big C church and the local smaller C church. So there's really helpful things about it, but absolutely it can be abused. Like, like we said, anything can be used in a good way or a bad way. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And just like in our, in our, even our really, really healthy earthly families, mm-hmm. there's tension uh, and there's conflict you have to work through and you, we can expect that, but to do it in a non-controlling uh, healthy way is, is really, really important. So Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, Chris, you feeling better? I am feeling better. Yeah. I'm not hundred percent, but almost there. So great. Hopefully we'll be better Sunday. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're looking forward to seeing you guys. We've got a great uh, Sunday planned, great worship set. Third, is it the third week of the third week series? Third week. Yeah. It's starting to get a lot more focused now and uh, uh, applicable to taking all these big ideas and now how does that get worked out in the life of the church? So the mm-hmm. next two weeks, this Sunday, we're going to talk about the importance of gathering together Ooh. and what happens there and why we do it. And then the following Sunday will be 
after we gather, we scatter. And what's the purpose of the church scattering? What do we do as we go and leave? When we're not together, what's God calling us to do? So Outstanding. Yes. That's great. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you guys, and we'll see you Sunday morning. See you all. Have a good one.